Good afternoon and welcome to our Grow Native webinar, Gardens of Excellence with Reva Dow, Cody Hayo, and Craig Thompson. My name is Haley Howard and I am the Outreach and Education Coordinator for the Missouri Prairie Foundation. I wanna thank you all for joining us for this webinar today and thank our Grow Native sponsors for 2023. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please only put those in the Q&A section on your screen. And at the end, I will read those out to our Garden of Excellence panelists. This webinar is being recorded and the link will be shared with all of you tomorrow, along with resources mentioned during the presentation and Q&A session. And now for some background on our panel. Reva Dow is the manager of Twin Pines Conservation Education Center. She has two Bachelor of Science degrees, one in forest management from the University of Missouri, as well as a teaching degree from Southwest Baptist University. She has 27 years of teaching experience and worked as a National Park Service interpreter for Ozark National Scenic Riverways before joining the Missouri Department of Conservation. Reva worked for several years as a naturalist at Twin Pines before assuming her current position. Her experience with MDC includes conservation efforts throughout the Ozark region, assisting with prescribed burns, chronic wasting disease management, and invasive species management. She enjoys birding and helping cultivate the wildflower beds at Twin Pines. Cody Hayo has worked as a horticulturist and landscape professional for over 15 years in the St. Louis, Missouri area. In 2014, Cody founded Pretty City Gardens and Landscapes with a passion for connecting to the community. Supported by his team at Pretty City Gardens, Cody's background in ornamental horticulture, um, having also received a certificate of horticulture from St. Louis Community College in 2012, has served as a springboard for professional opportunities to work with native plants in storm water management gardens, including the South Grand Community yeah. Improvement District what? in St. Louis City, which was recognized by Grow Native as a native garden of excellence in 2022. And the design wow. and installation of over 100 residential and commercial projects for the MSD Rainscaping Small Grants Program since 2016. Cody has also served on the board of the Landscape Nursery Association of Greater St. Louis since 2015, including two terms as president. In December 2022, Cody became Grow Native <laughs> professionally certified. Last week, Craig Thompson just connected your phone. Just, just I come on right there. Yeah, yeah. If I could have everyone mute, please. Thank you. Lastly, Craig Thompson worked as a life scientist for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, before retiring in 2021 and is now vice president for Friends of Caw Point Park and chairperson on the Native Plant Committee. Craig has a bachelor's degree in environmental studies from the University of Kansas. During Craig's career, he assisted with several field studies, including collecting water samples for the Mississippi Missouri Nutrient Sampling Project, assisting the Water Quality Standards Branch with the Iowa Use okay. Attainability Analysis Stream Surveys, and assisting the monitoring staff in field collection of water and biological samples at lake and stream sites in the Kansas City metropolitan area. And now, for our presentation. Reba, turn it over to you. Okay. Okay, hope everyone can see that screen. Somebody give me a thumbs up so that I know that it's working good. Good deal. Okay. Yeah, I'm Reva Dow. I am the manager here at Twin Pines. I work for the Missouri Department of Conservation. Uh, Twin Pines is located in South Central Missouri. We are an educational facility. We serve uh, lots of school groups, youth organizations, and the general public. And we do that by highlighting the unique features of the Ozark region. 
So there's a quick picture of Twin Pines in the winter. You can kind of see our gardens in, in the winter state. And Twin Pines was established, um, it was around 2007, 2008. I get that uh, right When we began, our gardens were more of a prairie look. Everything was um, just grown together like you would find it in a prairie. And even, you know, in some situations that would work really well, but for our facility here, we uh, quickly realized it was hard to care for. It was difficult to manage that when it's really close to a facility or maybe your home. And this a situation, it was a facility. So we did plant seeds and we did use a lot of potted plants in that first uh, getting the gardens established. We used plants that were uh, restricted to local Shannon Carter County area. And then in 2012, we revamped and we went to organized beds. So that made our maintenance and weeding easier. It, um, we often use volunteers to help with that. We only plant one plant in each uh, section. Plants from the Ozark region, um, more, we spread out a little bit more from just Shannon and Carter County and uh, were used in those initial beds. And this allowed the individual species from out competing each other and the beds are very visually appealing uh, but, and made it easier to tend. So the native wildflower gardens here at Twin Pines hold a variety of plants native to the local areas. And uh, wildflowers of course support biodiversity. They attract birds butterflies, bees and, bees, and other beneficial insects. And of course, being an educational facility, we use our gardens to educate the visiting public and for program participants. We do have sidewalks around the facility and the gardens are accessible from, for viewing from those sidewalks. And then we also have small chip covered, wood chip covered trails that allow access into the middle of the beds, uh, which allows for uh, easier maintenance. Most of the plants throughout our grounds are, uh, have the identification labels and we use those labels with, or have on them the common name and the Latin name. And we are an education facility. So this allows garden use for classes and for public enjoyment. The identification labels serve as educational tools for our visitors and our program participants. Uh, I help maintain the gardens when time allows. And it seems like, you know, recently it's not been as much time as I would like but I give credit to my crew for keeping our gardens in tip top shape. And uh, we have staff and we have volunteers who provide maintenance to the gardens. Plants are selected by seasonal bloom time, their height, habitat, soil and light conditions, their color. And then we also include a lot of grasses and shrubs. I'm gonna quickly kind of go through a few slides for different seasons for here at Twin Pines. So this one be, would be uh, the spring, the native honeysuckle. This one is Indian paintbrush, purple coneflower, again, you know, late spring. And then as we get into the summer, you would be seeing uh, coneflower and then you can see like two beds here kind of with the butterfly weed back behind. This becomes a time uh, where there's a lot of maintenance going on. So we do a lot of deadheading, but we do, you know, some plants are left with the seed heads for uh, the wildlife and for uh, the reproduction. And then in the fall, I have, you know, this is Shining Blue Star and the uh, Beauty Berry with the winged sumac behind. This one looks kind of drab color wise, but this was the one recently. This is the winter and, uh, you, and from it, you can see how we kind of organize our beds and 
to those individual uh, species. And um, any plant that jumps beds and is considered a weed when it ends up in a bed that it doesn't belong in. So those have to be removed and reestablished. So the picture on the right shows one that has recently been uh, reestablished with uh, going back to the just one individual plant. And then you can kind of see in the background how our the chip trails are used so that we can get around and do the maintenance. I don't believe any of our plantings or the little small beds are more than four feet across so that you, you don't actually have to get out into the middle of the bed. You can just do all the maintenance from the outside. And then we also have um, different plant communities, habitats. We have a pond area where the wetland, that would be where the rose mallow is blooming. We have a dry area that's more glady and prickly pear. And then we also have, we call it a wild edibles garden, which would include strawberries and elderberries, uh, golden currant. And uh, the flowers, of course, attract pollinators, which here there's bee, and this is, I think, all butterflies, but there's also bees and beetles, moths, uh, wasps, hummingbirds, and all of our native wildlife need native plants to survive. We also have four different uh, milkweed species. We have common, purple, butterfly, swamp marsh. And then of course, the birds and the butterflies also use plants for food and cover. And then we also have lots of animals that visit our gardens, which would include rabbits, you know, snakes, turtles, squirrels, of course. And there's an old saying, if you build it, they will come. And we have definitely seen that happen here at Twin Pines. But it's not only pollinators and birds that visit. We also have lots of school groups and we have program participants that use our gardens. And so this slide shows one of our educational classes. It was on um, the purple cone flower. And we have offered some quilting classes in, of, and you can see how participants use their knowledge and skills to produce some beautiful stuff. And then we also do a lot of nature journaling and we've, done, we've had some watercolor classes where the participants usually tour the wildflower garden. They learn about the importance of milkweed here with the uh, monarchs. And uh, they learned the importance of the milkweed, you know, in the life cycle of the monarch butterfly. And then they also came in and used the watercolors to, to, uh, to uh, paint their picture. The bottom line is, you know, diversity is the key to success for us. So uh, what can you do? You can, you know, plant native plants. You consider variety, consider bloom time. And, uh, you know, it's up to you if you want to go with that prairie look or more like what we're doing with the individualized plants. We are very proud of our gardens, our native wildflower gardens here at Twin Pines, and uh, we love to share them. So I invite you to stop by and visit anytime you're here in Southern Missouri in our area. And that pretty much wraps up mine. So thank you. Stop sharing. Thank you, Reva. And now we will hear from Cody. All right. Thank you. Pull my presentation up. All right. So, uh, yeah, thanks everybody for uh, attending and inviting me to be part of the panel today. As Haley mentioned at the beginning of the webinar with the introductions, my name is Cody Hale and I'm owner of Pretty City Gardens and Landscapes in St. Louis City. And I'm going to speak to you today about the South Grand Community Improvement District and the planning and maintenance in that space. So first, I want to start with uh, the location. 
to kind of orient everyone here. We're in, in St. Louis City, and I highlighted on the far left there, I highlighted the South Grand Community Improvement District space in red, and then I did a slightly closer image there where you can see uh, that we're just south of the Missouri Central Garden and Tower Grove Park along Grand Avenue. And then I zoomed in even further to show you what, what the gardens are that we're talking about here. They occur at each of the intersections. It's kind of a network of gardens, small sort of um, patches that are, are linked together throughout the street. And then here we are with this photo at, at street level. The is again, this is a network of gardens over six and a half blocks. I believe they were planted in 2013 and includes 14 rain gardens, 32 bump outs. The bump outs are kind of what you're looking at here in this photo. Par there's, a, there's a parking lot and there's also a small pocket park where uh, they, they have hold several events. In total, all the areas combined are about a half acre in size. The Community Improvement District, it's a special tax district. It's a kind of operates as a political subdivision for those who are unfamiliar with that term. Uh, they, they plan regular events and services throughout the district that kind of focus on improving the, the local economy, community, culture, and so on. And that's where they that's where they get the budget to provide these regular services for the for the street, including they've got more regular street sweeping, trash porter service. There's always a lot of trash here. It's a very urban, very busy space and then the garden maintenance as well, which we're providing. So the planning, the planning on this uh, space was actually quite involved and it started well before I, my firm was involved in maintaining the space. The, the South Grand Community Improvement District was established in 2001. And then after that time, I don't know exactly when that began, but they, they started talking planning for this space development. And I know clearly between 2009 to 2013, they really looked at this corridor wide study that started about at Tower Grove Park and stretched south for about a mile and a half. And then that focus zone in this picture is where the community improvement district exists at six and a half blocks where the garden was put in. And they, it was really a transportation study that they were looking at as well. Uh, the amount of vehicles that were coming through, the speeding, um, the pedestrian safety, all those things were concerns, as well as the amount of impervious service in the district. They were dealing with a lot of flooding issues prior to installation of the gardens. And uh, there, there were many different partners involved in this, um, in this effort. It's obviously the South Grand Community Improvement District was, was there already. Also, the Missouri Department of Transportation was involved with planning MSD, which is our local sewer municipality or service, the uh, Department of Natural Resources. One of the big ones early on was East West Gateway Council of Governments, which identified the South Grand project as one of their initial rate streets pilot projects. Those focus on the roadways, streetscapes, landscapes, and lighting. And in that study that I mentioned, the kind of traffic study they had found that there were nearly 25,000 vehicles per day passing through the space, going an average of 42 miles an hour, exceeding that 25 mile per hour speed limit. There was also a very high level of impervious surfaces. South Grand was able to find and acquire uh, secure funding through an EPA stormwater grant, 319 grant, which allowed them to install the, the rain gardens and things that you'll see in the photos here. The, the, work, the design firm, Design Workshop Inc., who was hired to work on this project, looked at over 40 different metrics, in, which is, you can see in this photo here, all the different things they were considering when coming up with this plan, including things like pedestrian mobility, employment, urban wildlife, rate of return. And uh, they received several uh, different awards and recognitions for their efforts with this, which really stated that it redefined the relationship between transportation and community. So it's, it really was a very exciting project. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about the awards that in recognition they've received later. Here's a, a, a rough before and after of what you can see that the street looked like prior to the, to the project being done. Uh, sidewalks were widened when they put the gardens in. And then at each of the intersections, they kind of created this bottleneck and narrowed the, the lanes of traffic. It used to be four lanes of traffic two going in either direction. They narrowed that to three lanes with one turn, turn lane down the middle. 
and uh, put in these gardens at the edges. So this is what it looked like immediately after planting the picture on the right there. That's mostly prairie drop seed and orange cone flower that you see Rebecca Pulgida on the border. We've since increased that uh, diversity quite a bit, as you can see in the pictures of that were taken in more recent years between 2019 to 2022. And this is mostly what the gardens look like today. You'll see still that Rebecca Fulgida there in the foreground. There's also some Coreopsis, Lentilata here in, in the immediate foreground and kind of mixed in in the middle area of the garden. The white blooms are slender mountain mint. Then we have bee balm, Monarda fistulosa, purple coneflower, purple prairie clover, uh, prairie drop seed, and there's gray, some gray headed coneflower in the center of the photo as well. And that's what these kind of look like at each different intersection, slightly different compositions. We've had to do a lot of tweaking, and I'm going to speak a little bit later as well about the maintenance challenges, which include kind of plant selection, constant weeding, and constant sort of tweaking. The Monarda in particular, that Monarda fischelosa, has been kind of a, a bully for us. It's expanded its boundaries and kind of taken over some of the other plants. There is a small amount of, of liriope in some of the beds, which is a non-native species. I think the initial plan for the, for the district was not so heavily focused on native plants, but after they acquired that, uh, the EPA 319 grant, there was, they kind of revisited their plans and put more natives in. So one last photo here of these gardens, and they really peak in kind of June and July. So if you're visiting the St. Louis area, you're here in June and July, come down to the, the district and this is what you'll see. Uh, I will talk a little bit more about that in a minute as well. Here, here's one of the rain gardens. All the other photos I showed you were the bump outs that contain that high diversity of different flowering plant species that I would call sort of stylized prairie, but particularly have, have heavy with the, the native forbs, the wildflowers, not so much grasses as you would see maybe on a prairie. Um, and but these are this is a picture of the rain gardens. They're mostly heavily dominated by southern uh, blue flag, the iris uh, virginica, virginia. And I put this photo in the corner to show you there are some, there is some interpretive signage to the district as well, explaining how these rain gardens work and what the people are seeing and looking at. Oops, I skipped ahead one photo there. Sorry, receiving a call. Um, so now to, to talk about maintenance a little bit for you. Um, my firm, Pretty City Guns Landscapes, got involved with maintenance in 2018, just at the end of 2017. We visit bi-weekly, these gardens bi-weekly, March through December to maintain them. We also walk the district annually and meet with the director to, to discuss and assess plans, tweaks that are needed for the upcoming year. We usually do that in late summer. We've renovated every intersection uh, since we, we got involved in 2018. And we also have a volunteer component that is managed by a volunteer coordinator, Angie Weber, who's not, uh, I think she's in a white hat in the middle of this photo here. Uh, they do monthly volunteer events and they've kind of adopted a couple parts of the district. And it's been a great way to engage and bring in the community. There are several master gardeners and other folks who volunteer with us as part of that program. You can visit the website there to read more about the, the Ego Crew and uh, if you're in the St. Louis area and you'd like to join us for a volunteer event, sign up. Or if you're passing through and it just happens to line up, maybe you can join us. Uh, but sometimes our crew is there, sometimes we're not there. It just depends on the timing of the events. Uh, but they happen on a monthly basis. They have all the dates up on the website. Oh, I keep skipping ahead. So here I want to go over a few slides of some of the ongoing maintenance challenges we face throughout the district. district. Uh, because this, there's a lot of water coming out the streets here, it also carries a lot of debris with it. The kind of four bays in our, our rain gardens, which is this settling space where the water comes in off the street, ends up clogging the, the, the gravel up a lot. This, we have to come in there annually and kind of clean this out. And you can see in the photo to the left, when that gets clogged, it does reduce the infiltration rate for the water. And we kind of end up with some temporary flooding. We also have a lot of car accidents and disturbance in the beds. This is part of the constant need for replanting corners and edges of medians that get run over by traffic. You can see in the center photo there, there's actually a truck in a rain garden. It, it crashed into the rain garden. They've had to knock over these, the light posts have been knocked over several times. The railing, the decorative railing 
which is really nice from a maintenance uh, uh, standpoint. It keeps the garden kind of contained, but they, it gets damaged frequently. There's also a lot of issues with the uh, irrigation. Now these are native plants. We're, we're not irrigating them as heavily as we might for um, other species that don't that wouldn't tolerate the this the uh, you know our natural climate without irrigation. But um, they are we do irrigate the garden to keep it looking its best. But we have a lot of issues with that. There's been vandalism. The the irrigation system used to go off in the middle of the night, uh, right around the time some of these restaurants and bars would close. We had people vandalizing the the, the sprinkler system at times. We would find uncap uh, you know caps for the system unscrewed. Sometimes the lines get broken. They don't work. Those accidents. The photo on the right shows some mulch that had been disturbed and irrigation heads that were hit by a truck that ended up in the in the landscaping bed again. So it's just it's a constant challenge to make sure things are working right and functioning as they should. And then we have plant selection and public perception. I mentioned a little bit earlier, these gardens really peak in June and July. And um, there's a lot of discussion around when there aren't a lot of blooms. Uh, some of the the folks in the district feel like they aren't seeing flowers and they think then they think it's just weeds and um, I will say that the, Rachel, the, the director of the district here has done a lot to really advocate for these gardens, point out what they've done for the district in terms of the flooding and uh, capturing stormwater, and also explaining to these, these people, and there's, there's a lot of education that goes into it, what they're seeing. So, um, and then the, the photo on the left is, so there's been some of the plants that get too tall and kind of flop, we've been able to, um, address those by cutting some of them back during the growing season or even after they're done blooming to keep them in check. So it's, it's an ongoing effort. We've kind of come up with a plan here uh, and ranked these objectives for maintenance. Number one, aesthetics. It's such a big part of what we do. It's a very high traffic, highly visible public space. We also obviously wanna, want to capture the stormwater deal with it, keep, keep dealing and addressing the flooding issues the district previously had, support that biodiversity. We've been increasing that number of species and then that education and outreach. So here are some of those awards and recognitions that the district has received. Back in 2010, when the project was first being unveiled and plans were being shared, it was awarded a, a sort of a best public sports project in our area by a local newspaper. Uh, they've also received, the planners received an honor and award and analysis planning for the, the way that they looked at those 40 different metrics. The district was also recently named a Great Places in America by the American Planning Association in 2017. And then as mentioned, we, of course, we were inducted the Native Gardens of Excellence program in 2022. So that is all I have for you. And I will pass it over to Craig. Thank you so much, Cody. And um, now we are going to hear from Craig and we'll get his uh, slides pulled up right now. Okay, um, can everybody hear me? I'm going to uh, talk about Call Point Gardens. And um, Call Point Gardens is located at Call Point Park in Kansas City, Kansas. Uh, the um, park is right at the confluence of the Kansas and Missouri River. And it's a beautiful site. Uh, it's probably one of the best views of downtown Kansas City, Missouri from, that, from, from the gardens actually. And uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, kind of the, a brief history of the um, how the gardens came about. Um, in 2003, we were uh, cleaning and preparing uh, the park uh, for the uh, Lewis and Clark Bicentennial that was uh, going to camp there in 2004. Uh, the, the park had been deserted or abandoned for several years. And so um, a lot of volunteers came in and picked up trash, a dumpster full of trash. Uh, we built a boat ramp. The boat ramp was um, 
uh, from the construction company that we um, uh, they volunteer their time and, and their efforts for that that boat ramp. Uh, we build an amphitheater, uh, and uh, we also um, seeded this hillside. And um, see if I can go to the next slide. How did I do that? It's not the next slide. <laughs> Hi, this is Erica with the Prairie Foundation. Yeah. I am trying yeah. to advance the slide. Yeah. And it was it was advancing before, but it is not advancing okay. now. Um Haley, do you want to try to share this from your computer? Up in the upper right, you can, yeah, there you go. Okay. So this is the second slide of my um, my talk. Uh, this is the hillside I was talking about. Um, we had, um, around 2003 or thereabouts, uh, we were getting prepared for that Lucy Clark Bicentennial, and we decided we wanted to um, uh, protect this hillside. Um, we seeded it. Uh, with uh, prairie grasses and prairie wildflowers. And it, uh, it actually flourished for several years, but uh, noxious weeds came in and um, the city um, uh, got worried about it, you know, just uh, the Johnson grasses and all that. Uh, they started spraying and it just killed everything. Um, and it left this bare ground. There was uh, some mulberries in that um, upper right hand corner that almost died as well. So I'm not sure what they sprayed, but uh, um, they left this um, whole hillside um, just bare. And uh, next slide. Or can I advance that? So it just, uh, we had storm water uh, running off the parking lot and then coming down that, uh, that hillside. And uh, we'd come down to the um, the bow ramp. The next slide, and that's 2016. So we have um, flooding going on in the Call River. There's that uh, there's a light pole right there. That's where the bow ramp is. Um, and so there's a uh, like I said, there's erosion uh, coming down that hillside and going right down the actually the bow ramp and into the Kansas River. Next slide. So uh, about two years, we were uh, thinking what we could do. I, I had joined the uh, uh, Friends of Call Point Park uh, organization in 2010, but um, during this time, we were trying to figure out what we we're going to do uh, with this hillside. And so in 2017, we applied for a, a stormwater grant from Wyandotte County. And, uh, and so we were able to um, get um, some uh, ditch rock or... Um, riprap, you might say it, and um, put down to stabilize this uh, hillside. And then we also put a flagstone pathway through um, uh, this opening on this fence that goes in the middle of that, um, that hillside. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, 2019, a little bit later, but in that process of putting in a riprap, we put in five uh, gardens, garden beds, and uh, these garden beds are about approximately four by eight feet in, in length. There's another one about three uh, by six feet in length. And we already had, um, we had a lot of, uh, a pot full of, um, of um, Coreopsis, lance leaf Coreopsis seed. 
So we started seeding with that. Um, and then I also went to the Anita Gorman uh, Discovery Center to, uh, they had a, a native uh, plant um, sale in April. So I started buying uh, native prairie plants. Uh, this first, uh, um, these are the lower gardens. Um, and in 2019, um, there was quite a flood year. Uh, the whole park was uh, underwater for about two months. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this was uh, one of the uh, lower gardens I'm talking about. The water is coming up, uh, almost lapping on the, the edge of that garden uh, or the, um, the flagstone pathway. Uh, next slide, please. And this is a kind of a panoramic view of uh, the uh, riprap and uh, there's a flagstone uh, walkway there. There's a lady taking photographs of the, of the river. She's not too excited about my plants. <laughs> which are the, uh, the lower garden there, they're, um, the, um, yep, right in there. Um, Lance leaf coreopsis, uh, really like that area. Next slide, please. And it was in full sun, that's that lower garden. This is a just recent uh, photo in the spring, uh, May is when those uh, uh, Lance leaf coreopsis um, uh, come out and they really adapted well uh, to these, um, this rocky, um, um, area that we have for the, the, the garden beds and at Lower Garden. There's also, um, we had uh, poppy mallow there, pur purple poppy mallow. And then there is also um, some other uh, plants as well you can't see. There's Missouri primrose that we put in there. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is just looking up from the Lower Garden, going up the steps towards the, uh, uh, the um, uh, parking lot. Um, along the, uh, that's a butterfly weed there, um, and along the uh, steps and along the pathway there, we put uh, prickly pear cactus in there. We have uh, uh, rock pink. Uh, there's uh, there's uh, still some um, lance leaf coreopsis still blooming there as well. Uh, next slide, please. And then up that uh, ramp there from where we were the previous uh, um, slide is this um, other smaller garden, which is about three by six feet and uh, wild bergamot and, and some coreopsis. Uh, there's some uh, drop seed there, you approved drop seed, aromatic aster. There's a pale purple coneflower and um, I think blue sage is in this, uh, this little bed here. Uh, it's done really well. Um, next slide, please. And then uh, on the northern side of that uh, hillside, uh, just right along the boardwalk in the fence, uh, we have purple coneflower. Uh, we have um, uh, gray-headed uh, coneflower. Uh, we have compass plant. Uh, there's all kinds of plants in here. There's a um, Illinois bundle flower. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is uh, a fall shot and uh, we have um, Quite a few Maximilian sunflower. They just kind of took off. Uh, probably shouldn't never planted them, but they uh, uh, we're trying to control them. They um, they uh, they're a great uh, pollinator. You know, pollinators like not like this plant, uh, but they just kind of take over. Um, so uh, there's also aromatic aster that uh, is really um, common in this area too in the fall. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, <clears throat> just recently in 2021, um, we put up these interpretive signs. Um, we got a grant from uh, the, um, oh, it's the Lewis and Clark uh, Trail Heritage Foundation. And uh, we were able to purchase these signs, these interpretive signs. And uh, Lewis and Clark, uh, I think Lewis more than Clark was, um, you know, he was like the botanist and he was able to um, identify a lot of plants on their uh, journey up the Missouri River in, in 1804 and, and 1806. And uh, so um, I was able to identify 20 species and some that we brought into the, the park as well as that uh, Lewis and Clark uh, identified on their journey up the river. And uh, this is um, a sign that we have a QR code that you can scan and it goes to our website. Um, next slide, slide please. Uh, on that website, you'll have um, uh, our website's callpointpark.org. 
And on that website, we have a picture of the plant and uh, information how uh, Lewis described that plant uh, back in his day. And uh, I also put in information about how Native Americans have used a plant uh, for their use usage as well. Um, this is uh, Illinois bundle flower, and Lewis described this plant kind of interesting. It was compressed as a form of globular figure of a curious appearance. It was um, globular was misspelled the first time, but spelled right the second time there. But uh, this is on our website, and then also you can go to the park and scan uh, these interpretive signs. It'll take you directly to the um, to our website. Next slide, please. And I just want to put in a word about this other project that we had. Uh, it was um, done in 2020. Uh, we had a lot. We have a lot of bush honeysuckle uh, that we uh, took out of this area. Now we can see daylight, and um, um, so we had a lot of volunteers come out. We had chainsaws. And we had we had treated some of the bigger uh, uh, plants with Torridon. And then we had a day where we came out, uh, there, there, was, there was 30 plus volunteers. We came out and we had plugs of various woodland wildflowers and sedges, and also some uh, understory trees that we planted here. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this is just about six or eight months later, um, the wild sweet william came up. Uh, we had wild ginger there. Uh, there's various uh, understory trees that we planted, redbud, rough roughleaf dogwood, uh, service berry, uh, many other uh, understory trees. And this area is uh, turning really, really, really nice. Um, we, we're really proud of this. And we have more bush honeysuckle uh, just north of this, uh, this uh, what I call an upland area of the park that we need to remove. Um, overall, the uh, I think that the uh, Call Point Gardens, uh, the gardens that um, you know, I was just talking about earlier. Um, I think it was a pretty successful uh, project because uh, we didn't know what we we're going to do with that hillside. It just kept on eroding away, and um, I think that the riprap uh, really helped out. It's it's not what I wanted, but uh, it's it's more manageable. Those those five uh, gardens are more manageable, and um, we're um, also um, we have a lot of volunteers. I I actually put a a uh, article in the uh, Kansas City Gardener uh, to talk about the Call Point Gardens, but also try to re to uh, recruit people uh, to help out. Uh, we have a schedule. Um, it's a monthly schedule. Of, of, uh, it's usually the first or second uh, Saturday of the month from March to, um, to, 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 to November. And we've had quite a few people come out to help uh, oh, work in the garden, weed, and, uh, and to pick up trash at the park. And that's that's my presentation. All right, fantastic. Thank you all uh, for those great presentations on your gardens of excellence. And we do have time for some questions now and we have a few. Uh, so let's take a look at those. Um, one question that uh, was asked on the chat side, um, and this would be for uh, Reva, would be from Heidi, and she said they are new to Missouri and live um, near Columbia. And she wondered if the plants that you showcased in your garden of excellence can be used and would work um, where they live. I'm not positive, but uh, I know that the Missouri Department of Conservation webpage, and I'm sure there's other sources that uh, will give you uh, probably through the Prairie Foundation, through the uh, a list of plants that would be native plants that would grow in the Columbia area. Thank you. And I will add that we can definitely share uh, a, our Grow Native database uh, with our follow-up. And that will, that allows you to kind of um, narrow down your search based on the type of um, growing conditions that you have. 
So I will just also say as, uh, as a native gardener myself that I have native plants that um, are from all different parts of the state that work well in, in my area. And I live north of Kansas City about an hour. So that is um, one nice thing about our Missouri natives is that um, the climate isn't too different, you know, across the state to where a lot of those natives would work well um, in different locations. Another uh, question that was asked um, was from Jessica, and she uh, was kind of curious about, you know, the way the gardens look in the winter time, and she wondered if um, if you cut back all of the plants during the winter. So Cody, could you speak to that in terms of the South um, the South Grand Garden? Yeah. yeah, thank you. That's a good question. And I saw we have a, a member of the eco crew in the chat as well. So thank you to the folks who have volunteered with us in the past. Uh, for the winter cleanup, we do end up cutting back a lot of our plants in the fall. We've gone back and forth between whether or not we really want to do that, we know that leaving those stems will provide habitat for overwintering wintering wildlife. And we do leave plants standing in the in the Ritz Park area and the parking lot area that are kind of off the beaten path. But because our landscape is is so um, kind of very busy, high profile, lots of lots of pedestrian traffic right next to it, we cut a lot of that down pretty low in the in the fall. We find that if we when we leave a thing standing, it also collects a lot of trash, which is unfortunate just given our, our very busy and urban location, it's not really feasible. Uh, I've also I've ran into this in other, you know, that's South Grand, but I've seen that issue pop up in other places we've worked as well and visited other sites to see what they're doing. And I, I feel like I see a lot of that. There's a lot of things that are kept nice and tidy, cut low near paths but then where it's your get off the path a bit, maybe five or 10 feet where you can leave things standing. So we do cut a lot of it back, but we leave some kind of select areas. Thank you. Reva, did you want to add anything to that? I know you said you kind of do the same where um, you cut back some plants, but not all of them. Right. And we kind of do like Cody said, it's kind of a rotation. So there may be parts of the garden as we are working them that are cut, you know, down low and, and then, uh, others that are left later in the season to provide that protection for the wildlife. And... Okay, thank you. And and Craig, did you have anything you wanted to add about your winter um, maintenance and for your garden? It's about the same thing what Cody said. I mean, basically we, you know, we cut some of the hardy stems down, you know, to a certain like eight to 12 inches, you know, for the Maybe the type of you know the bees or something uh, larvae get in there, so we we do that and we um, we remove some leaves. We leave some leaves in the uh, in the beds. Uh, the woodland area we just leave leave natural. All right. Another question coming from Ben was um, he was just kind of curious what kind of time commitment is required for the the weeding the mulching and the maintenance involved and i'm sure it's different for every garden so um so let's let's see what reva what do you what do you consider being a, a good amount of time to spend with maintenance right um good question it just kind of depends. I do have a native garden specialist on staff and she is a part-time person. She, I think she averages probably about 20 hours a week and the majority of her hours are spent in the beds. Now she is also, we have some trails, so she does some trails work and stuff too, but uh, we're very, very fortunate, you know, to have her on staff. And then, uh, and she does have volunteers that help her out and, you know, it's just kind of, they, they come when they can or when they have time or they'll sign up for, so it's kind of hard to, to give an exact time or period of that, how much volunteer time we have. But um, at the moment we have a volunteer coming probably two days a week for probably four hours each day. So I have the full-time staff and then have at least one volunteer that is real regular in helping. 
Great, thank you. Um, let's see, another question that Tina asked is, uh, are any of you using mason bee houses to promote pollinating? And I'm not really familiar with those. So is anyone on the panel familiar with what Tina might be referring to? Uh, like, well, I would say, I guess the, the, the insect or the bee hotel type things, uh, we are, we're, we're not using any of those on, on South Grand. Um, I know that I, I've heard of those being used for like food production on orchards where they're really concerned about getting active pollination. You know, this, our gardens are really mostly ornamental. They're also functioning, as I mentioned several times to control that storm water for us. We have pollinators definitely that do come and visit. I know that, uh, you know, we're, our, our, Folks are always excited when they see the bees and the butterflies visiting the plants. And um, I've, I know locally in St. Louis, I've been participating in a, in a native bee study that's looking at, you know, uh, shutter bee, which I think Grow Native has also kind of touched on a bit, but that doesn't um, necessarily intersect with what's going on on South Grand. Uh, but, you know, it's open, things can come and pollinate. We're not necessarily concerned with getting seed or fruit or from the plants, but it, it, they definitely are getting pollinated. Great, and one more question for you since you're already on, Cody. Um, yeah. Susan had asked, uh, what is your role in the ongoing development of South Grand Project? Yeah, so our role, we, we, we're continuing providing regular maintenance. So as I mentioned before, we're there um, every, every two weeks, we're there for a full day. And I, wanted, I did wanna to touch on that other question about the maintenance because I've seen that discussed uh, in terms of the number of minutes even per square feet by some other folks locally that really focus on native landscaping. And it can vary quite a bit when you have a more formal landscape versus a more naturalized wild landscape in terms of how active you need to be with the maintenance. But we are, we are providing ongoing regular maintenance for more formal landscape. We're there quite a bit. And we, as I mentioned as well, we're doing that annual walkthrough with the director of the district and providing recommendations for infill and sort of renovations for each of the landscape beds as time goes on. They are, I know that South Grand just announced that they would be working with a, another firm to look at some kind of some district wide changes that might involve the way that they're, they use their parking lot, which we currently do have some gardens in and I don't, I don't, that's just sort of in the planning stages. So I assume once we get to that point of any decision to be made, we may be cons consulted, but right now it's just keeping them looking good and keep the gardens looking good and, and do some renovations as needed. That's kind of our ongoing role right now. Great, thank you. Um, I'm assuming that um, we have had a question about you know, getting confirmation on what plants people are are trying to decide whether to choose or not. Um, so uh, Cody is the only panelist out of this group that is uh, on the consulting side. Would, would I be correct in saying that, Cody? Or would you be on the consulting side as well with your business? Uh, just providing uh, information as, as a consultant. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, um, you know, we might have a, a few of those questions um, after this that might be asked. Sure. A few other questions that came up. Um, one from Jackie asked, what do you mulch your perennial beds with? Um, Reva, can you speak to that? We use wood chips. We, uh, you know, the other, we have some wood chips that are larger for the past, but the majority of ours is uh, just small wood chips. Okay. And Cody, would, do you guys use mulch? What kind of mulch do you use? We do use mulch. We'll use, we tend to use like Reva, we're using a wood-based mulch, but we like a finer textured mulch around the perennials as well. So we, we tend to try to go for like a triple ground type product. 
so it's not doesn't have the big uh, chunks in it. Okay, thank you. Um, a question for for Craig, um, since you sounds like have some experience removing bush honeysuckle, Susan wanted to know uh, kind of what that uh, process entailed. Um, it's a lot of work. <laughs> you have a lot of bush honeysuckle. <laughs> So um, that woodland area was just thick with the uh, bush honeysuckle and you just got to have a lot of manpower, you know, a lot of, you know, access to chainsaws if they're pretty good size, you know, they almost, some of those were almost the size of trees. Uh, I bought Toradon uh, for the stumps, you know, once we cut the um, bush honeysuckle down, we the toradon on on those trees and uh, you don't drop that toradon anywhere else or it'll kill something else and we killed a couple of mulberries in a pro process of uh, putting putting that on those stumps mm. um bush honeysuckle just pops up everywhere and you know once you got it out of the you know that that woodland area that i just talked about we had to go back through there and see if there's any you know young saplings coming back up you just gotta you can pull some of those up by hand so um, that's a, that's a good thing, uh, but once they get established, uh, they're they're hard to um, to pull up, or you you have to cut cut them down with a chainsaw or a saw. Um, so that's pretty you know that's pretty much you, know, you just have to have um, you know uh, a day going out there you know trying to you know use gloves and you know you just got to uh, really you know tackle this uh this critter it's it's just everywhere at the call point park it's uh we have more um more than more to do in the future so if anybody wants to help us with that that would be great <laughs> thank you for that um there's a, a good question that came in from Araceli, i think is how you pronounce their name um the question is do you prefer um to incorporate specific grasses, species of grasses into your gardens? And is there a certain ratio of, you know, grasses to forbs that is utilized? And anyone can speak to that if, if they're able to. Uh, sure, I'll jump in. We, um, you know, on South Green, there are, there are not very many grasses in, mixed in with our forbs. We have some tree wells that are primarily planted with prairie drop seed, which I think is con definitely considered one of our most formal native grasses. It's pretty short. Um, there's also side oats grandma that I like to use a lot, budaloa, kernopendula on the short side. And then I, but I really do like that, that mixed texture of native wildflowers and grasses. So uh, in terms of ratios, I, I think we probably tend to stay within that like 30 to probably not quite 50% range uh, when we're, and, and we primarily plant plugs. So I think when you're getting into seeding and maybe Craig can speak to that a little bit or, or Reba, we don't, we don't tend to do uh, as much landscapes established from seed, but then you might have a different uh, approach on that percentage that you're looking at. Reaver, Reaver Craig, do you guys wanna say anything about that maybe? Well, for us here, our gardens are a little bit more formal, I guess. Um, we do use some grasses. Um, we use it more, I know that we have some, it's more for educational. So we have some big blue stem, we have some of the, you know, different ones, but very few and, um, I shouldn't say really few, but it's not like a formal garden. Maybe a couple of clumps here or there just to accent some of the plants. Great, thank you. I, I noticed that we've had several questions about interpretive signage. Um, so I will just point out that uh, Grow Native has uh, partnered with Wild Ones chapter in St. Louis to produce some interpretive signs. I think there are about 100 native plant species that are currently available. And those um, can be found on the Grow Native uh, gift shop 
and we can link to that tomorrow. Um, but a specific question for Cody was, um, did you, do you think that there has been a noticeable difference um, with the signage and maybe even Reva could speak to that as well or Craig um, in helping folks to, you know, increasing interest in natives and um, helping folks see that, you know, it's not, they're not just, you know, that there's more to natives and they might not look as, you know, perfect as some non-native gardens, I guess. So how, what are, you, what are your feelings on those interpretive signs that you used? Yeah, so the, the signs that we have on South Korean primarily identify, uh, they, they describe what's going on in the gardens because the, the, the way that rain gardens work and function is different than just a, a, a you know, just a, a, a lawn alternative we use or those bump outs, which are just regular gardens without any kind of not necessarily filtering any storm water directly into them. So that's the, the, I think they do help a lot for people to understand what's going on in those gardens. We're not so much focused on identifying the specific species of plants that people are seeing, um, but we have, we have been having other ongoing discussions in related work that we do about more interpretive signage to talk about what people are seeing and the way that native landscapes are managed. So that is a good question. And I, I do think it is something that we, we need to focus a bit more on. And I don't know if the signs that uh, Reva or maybe Craig have that might focus on that as well, or if they'd like to speak to that a little bit as well. I can say a little bit about our interpretive signs are more educational. Um, uh, mostly have to do with Lewis and Clark and what they discovered uh, when they came up the Missouri River in 1804 and 1806. And um, it's my hope that people can come down to the park and use their camera phone and bring up the QR code and scan it and find out a little bit more information about the, the plant that they're looking at. Um, we have pawpaws down there and that was uh, significant. Um, it was a food resource for Lewis and Clark when they came back through here in 1806. Um, men were running out of food and they were eating pawpaws in September when they were coming through here. But, uh, you know, I hope hopefully this is um, an educational thing. Um, and maybe they'll learn a little bit more about the plant itself. There is some Native American uh, language too and uh, on that website uh, that talks about how the Native Americans have used some of these plants. And not, not a lot of people maybe know that. I mean, that's um, history that may have been lost. So um, we're, we're happy to get those signs up. Wonderful. Well, I think that um, pretty much wraps up the questions. So I really appreciate your guys' help in answering those. Um, and again, thank you so much for sharing your wonderful gardens with us. Um, I think that um, these have sparked a lot of interest and it's, it's neat to see them coming, you know, these gardens from different areas of the state and how they have developed. So for, um, for this particular webinar, I just want to remind everyone that tomorrow we will send out a recording of this uh, along with an email that lists helpful resources that were discussed during this webinar. And if you enjoyed this webinar, please um, think about attending our next master class, which is entitled Prairie Garden Primer for Town and Country. And that'll be on Wednesday, March 29th with Scott Woodbury. And then we have another Missouri Prairie Foundation webinar on April 12th coming up. And that is entitled The Tall Grass Prairie of Missouri Above and Below the Soil Surface. And that's with Sam Lord. So again, thank you so much for joining us today and uh, be gardening. Take care.